We're talking about chapter 27, which is toxicology today. Make sure to go through the learning objectives in each uh, chapter to make sure you're on track with what you're supposed to learn and take away from each chapter. So starting with how do we manage poison emergencies? If it's an emergency, um, if, if it's a question about oh, did they eat enough to make them sick, is what they ate something that will make them sick, you're going to get a phone call typically first. And so you're going to want to um, talk to the client and calm them down and say, what are they doing now? What is the current clinical status of the animal? What are they vomiting? Um, you know, what, what is the, where's their behavior? Uh, what is going on right now? When was the animal exposed to it? How much of the toxin was it exposed to? What was the animal exposed to exactly? We want them to bring it in. So even if it's a chewed up partial container, we want to see it. Um, it can kind of give us an idea of what, how much they were exposed to. We want to know when because sometimes some of the treatment that we do um, can only be done in the first half hour to an hour. And so we want to know when did the exposure occur? How old is the animal? How much does it weigh? Male, female, uh, animal lactating or pregnant? Um, the signalment will make a difference in their prognosis. We want to know about their uh, history of health problems. If they you know, already have a, a problem with their kidneys or their liver, is this toxin going to make it worse? Are they on any medications that could potentially interact with what they ate? Um, have they had any recent surgeries? And has the owner done anything to treat the animal? Did they try to make it vomit? Emesis is vomit. So did they try to bring it up, make it vomit, and have any other animals been exposed? Our initial assessment of the uh, potential toxicosis starts with assessing the present condition. So we're going to examine the respiratory rate, cap capillary refill time, mucous membrane color, heart rate, their body temperature, and there's, um, so the CRT and the mucous membranes TPR, that's the normal stuff that we do, right? So that starts with the first one. So signalment, get the signalment, do your CRT and mucous membranes, your TPR, and then make sure that your vital functions are stabilized. Um, we've got airway, breathing, and circulation. Um, we want to address and make sure that they, we've, we have them breathing and their heart is beating before we do any type of decontamination. We want to monitor that cardiovascular system very closely as we decontaminate. And we often need to place an IV catheter so we can administer medications or fluids and just be ready if they should have a reaction. When we're talking about decontamination, basically what we're trying to do is remove as much of the toxin from the body as possible. So if they have um, been exposed to it through their eyes, then we want to flush the eyes um, repeatedly with tepid water or warm water for about 20 to 30 minutes. We want to look at the eyes and make sure, we can do it also with an eye flushing solution. We want to look at the eyes to make sure there's no corneal damage. A lot of um, chemicals can burn the cornea, and you won't necessarily see it when you look at the cornea, but if you do it at fluorescein eye stain, um, it will uh, show that we have some damage to the cornea. Then we have dermal exposure. So if they've got it on their skin, or for instance, if we had a cat that was, um, uh, that uh, dog flea medicine was put on that's very toxic to cats. Um, we want to bathe that animal with a liquid dishwashing detergent. And I'm just going to throw this out here. Um, it's not a, not a commercial. Um, I'm not getting paid by Dawn, but Dawn dishwashing liquid um, is the best one uh, that we use for this. It just does a really good job of breaking up the oils um, that are used to, to bring that um, medication into the skin. Um, we want the technician, when you're washing the animal, washing toxins off the animal, you should be properly protected, so wear gloves. Uh, I've put gloves here on this picture so that I've made this person wear gloves while they're washing that very happy cat. Uh, if we're dealing with sticky substances, we do have to be careful. A lot of things that get rid of sticky substances have chemical solvents that can be damaging and toxic um, in their own right uh, to animals, especially cats. So usually when we're dealing with really sticky stuff, we want to use oils um, like a mineral oil um, or a uh, olive oil or even peanut butter oil uh, to remove that, that uh, stick. 
If they drink it or otherwise ingest it orally, um, often if we can dilute it, we can um, uh, we can remove the issue, um, especially if it's a corrosive or an irritant ingestion. So anything that they eat or drink that might be have extra acid or extra base in it, so really soapy stuff or something that's acidic like a chemical um, or it's some type of irritant, um, we don't want to bring it back up through that esophagus. The esophagus is really very um, uh, fragile uh, piece of tissue <clears throat> and it can do a lot of damage coming back up. So if we can dilute this uh, substance with either milk or water, um, that can be helpful because uh, we don't want to bring it back up. Um, vomiting is often performed in cases of toxin ingestion. Uh, but we have to be careful when we do it. So the time since ingestion is really important, and that's because um, food uh, and whatever else they've eaten will move through the stomach at a relatively quick uh, rate. So within 30 to 60 minutes, that toxin has probably already moved outside of the stomach and we cannot, vomiting will not bring it up. If the animal is really depressed or in a coma and doesn't swallow really well, we don't want to induce vomiting. If we have the animal has swallowed something that has oil or petroleum in it, and that includes Vaseline, um, we do not want them to bring it up uh, because if they vomit something with oil or petroleum in it and they aspirate that, it stays in the lungs and we can't remove it and that will cause them to die. So emesis only if it's not something that's corrosive, an irritant, something that's really sharp, that's kind of dangerous, or an oil. Apomorphine hydrochloride is the preferred emetic agent for dogs. It comes in tablet or liquid form. Um, often if we have a tablet, we actually will put it in the conjunctal tival sac, which is if you think of conjunctiva or conjunctivitis, that's around the eye. So if we pull the lower eyelid out and stick the uh, corner of the tablet um, right in there and just let it sit there, it, it affects those little blood vessels there and gets into the system really quickly and actually will make that the animal uh, vomit very quickly. More and more, we're moving away from that uh, and moving towards giving that as an IV injection. Um, and it is available um, as an IV injection, although it's somewhat expensive. So this little tablet, though, is interesting because you never think that this would work, but we take this tablet and put it um, inside the eyelid, close their eye, let it sit there for a few minutes. Within seven minutes, they're vomiting. Um, and then we need to remove that uh, tablet, realize that it does cause some damage to the cornea, so we want to rinse it out really well and check the cornea after we've uh, applied it. When they vomit, um, they will vomit up about 80% of what they've ingested. So only 80%, that means 20% can be left behind. Once they've stopped vomiting, we can give them something like <clears throat> activated charcoal or activated charcoal with a cathartic. The uh, difference between these two um, bottles, Toxaban and Toxaban uh, with Sorbitol, is not just that they're blue and red, but it's also the fact that this has sorbitol in it, which is a cathartic. What it does is, so the, the charcoal is going to bind the toxin and take it out through the, the gut, through the intestinal tract. Um, with the cathartic, that sorbitol, it will bind the intestine, and then the cathartic makes it move through the GI tract faster. So it can lead to some loose stools and some diarrhea. So we don't want to give it to an animal that already has di uh, diarrhea or is already dehydrated. We also want to avoid charcoal if the animal has ingested caustic materials um, because we want to make sure that um, uh, we're, we're, what, what we're trying to bind are toxins and not necessarily those caustic materials. Remember those caustic materials, we're going to give a lot of milk or water and just dilute it out. Enemas can be helpful when elimination of toxicants from the lower GI tract is desired. So if it's already moved all the way through the GI tract, but we still want to remove it, we can use an enema, just plain soapy water or even plain warm water. We don't do it on birds, um, but every other animal can get an enema and get cleaned out. We can also do a gastric lavage, which is basically pumping the stomach contents. Um, stick a tube in the esophagus all the way down to the stomach, um, put some fluid or water in there, um, and uh, have it come back out.
Um, we try to get it nice and clean out there, and we're not going to do this if we have a caustic material or petroleum distillate ingestion, because again, we don't want to get that into the to the lungs or come back out through the esophagus. Something that's pretty drastic is called an enterogastric lavage. <clears throat> it's also called a through and through lavage. We do an enema um, to eliminate um, all the large pieces of fecal material, and then we use a um, a large amount of water. So we try to get all the stool cleared out and then we use a large amount of water through the colon and until we have everything coming out the stomach tube is nice and clear. So it goes all the way through the animal from the back to the front. The technician plays a critical role during decontamination um, because you need to routinely evaluate the vital signs and, and watch for any parameters that are likely to be affected by the toxicant. Uh, we might need blood samples, uh, we might need to do pulse ox, we might need to do EKG. Uh, we do definitely need to do a lot of good nursing care. Now, how do you know what kind of supportive care you need for the toxicant um, that you're doing, that, you're, that the animal has eaten? Well, we can learn different things that are toxic to pets, but often they get into things that uh, we don't know a whole lot about. So there's a number that you can call. The ASPCA has a poison control center for pets. It does cost money, um, so you need to let the um, pet owner know this, that there, there is a charge um, associated with it. But they, they will actually, once you start talking with them, it's one cost, um, it's like $65 or something. And, and once you start talking with them, they take you through the entire case day after day after day um, and help you <clears throat> go through and make sure that the pet's going to be okay. So some foods that are toxic to pets um, are cocoa and chocolate, grapes and raisins, avocados, tomatoes, alcoholic beverages, specifically hops, um, as uh, uh, the, the leftovers <clears throat> um, after uh, beer has been made, onions and garlic, xylitol in chewing gum or in anything else that's sugar-free, and macadamia nuts. Those are the main ones. Also, we have to remember moldy food is not a good idea. <clears throat> Mold, um, some molds can contain tremorgenic mycotoxins, uh, which means that they're going to start to tremor. Um, we can get that diagnosis if we look at the stomach contents and we see moldy food. Uh, and obviously, we want to make sure that this is not available. Um, this is uh, hot dogs with some mold on it, some bread with some mold on it. Any treatment we do for moldy food will minimize absorption. Um, we're going to decontaminate, <clears throat> get rid of the food um, from their system, and get them some um, toxaban. Chocolate contains two things that are pro a problem. It contains th theobromine and caffeine. Both of these are stimulants. <clears throat> As stimulants, they cause some a variety of effects. They can cause lethargy if it's really bad, polyuria, polydipsia, so a lot of, um, they drink a lot, they urinate a lot, vomiting, diarrhea, hyperactivity, tremors, and increased heart rate. The problem with the increased heart rate is it, in, it can increase to the point that it actually kills the dog. We do want to do early treatment, including decontamination pre procedures and do some supportive care. It does take a fair amount of chocolate um, to kill a dog, and the kind of chocolate really matters. So the darker or more bitter the chocolate is, the more likely they are to have an issue. Onions, or anything part of the allium family, so onions and garlic, um, will cause an onion poisoning in dogs. So we have hemolytic anemia, hemoglobinuria, vomiting, weakness, and pallor. Um, their red blood cells basically break up. Um, they blow apart, um, and so you're going to see some hemoglobin in the urine. There'll be vomiting. They're they're very weak. Um, they're anemic. Um, we need to decontaminate uh, as quickly as possible, and they may need to have a blood transfusion. Macadamia nuts cause uh, problems with dogs, uh, including weakness, depression, vomiting, ataxia, tremors, and hyperthermia. Will actually make them very very hot. Some other dangerous food items, um, bread dough with raw yeast. The yeast will continue to rise in the, um, in the um, stomach, and so it, will, it can be actually life-threatening because it will bloat the stomach. <clears throat> so if we can get them some cold water or ice cubes, <clears throat> we can actually halt the rising process and keep them from getting too sick. 
grapes and raisins, uh, they cause kidney failure in some dogs. Um, we're looking for azotemia. Azotemia is, you should know this word, uh, is when we see an increase in the blood urea nitrogen or ammonia, basically, uh, that's in the blood. Uh, and that can be very dangerous and toxic to the animal. We need to help them to vomit and administer activated charcoal if they eat grapes or raisins. Xylitol is highly dangerous to animals, and there are a lot of sugar-free human food items, gum, peanut butter, honey, jelly, um, even some um, mouth uh, sprays and, and that kind of thing. Um, it's available. It's there. It's out there. It's in your home. Um, it, we will see liver failure uh, with this, but actually we first see hypoglycemia. So if the, if, then that's what's going to uh, kill them, actually. So if we can get them past this hypoglycemia part, then we have to look for liver failure. Um, if they've recently ingested it, we need to get it out of their system immediately. We need to get it out as, as quickly as possible and then try to get the, make sure that their glucose stays normal. This is the amount of chocolate that will kill a Labrador versus the amount of gum that will kill a Labrador. So you can see it takes a lot more chocolate, and this is dark chocolate, um, not milk chocolate. Um, it takes a lot more of that than, than it would for xylitol uh, to kill the, the animal. So that's three pieces, like little chiclet pieces of gum for to kill a Yorkie. Some other things that we can um, see a problem with. <clears throat> so acids and alkalis, things, the chemicals that you use for cleaning, Sometimes things that are in um, stuff that you use like toothpaste, batteries, um, anti-rust compounds, drain openers, that kind of thing. You wouldn't think that they would eat them or drink them, but I've seen it happen. So you do need to be very careful. The, the problem with, um, so acids, you will see a problem right away. They, it will burn right away. With alkalis, sometimes it takes a little bit of time. Think of alkalis as, as um, uh, soap um, things that uh, suds um, often you can use it uh, for a period of time and but it's not until it sort of starts to break down that you start to feel the burns and stuff and the, and the extent of burns can be delayed for several hours so we won't see the full extent for a while bleaches can cause uh, vomiting um, detergents can cause um, uh, vomiting and diarrhea Zinc, um, which is in galvanized hardware, bolts, nuts, and U.S. pennies, um, we have to get that zinc out of the GI tract because it will kill the kidneys. Uh, we can give them IV fluids to help protect the kidneys, but uh, if too much damage has been done, there's not much we can do. So even if they were able to pass this little this metal piece through their um, GI tract, it, it, we still need to get that zinc out before it starts to break down and they start to absorb it into their body. Lead, we find in paint, toys, drapery weights, uh, linoleum, <clears throat> automotive batteries, plumbing materials, uh, galvanized wire. It does affect multiple body systems and we want to remove the lead particles via bulk diet therapy. What is bulk diet therapy? Well, it's basically increasing the fiber intake. And a lot of times all I do is tell the, the uh, owners to get a, a loaf of whole wheat bread and feed it to them. So a, a smaller dog, maybe half a loaf, a larger dog, maybe a loaf and a half. Um, but it, it increases the fiber and moves the GI tract and kind of surrounds whatever's in there and pulls it out. Uh, we may need to pull stuff out with endoscopy or even surgery. Nicotine, tobacco products, um, causes death as a, as a result of respiratory paralysis. It's bad to smoke around your dog, but it's even worse if they eat it. Um, silica gel packs, um, basically they're a problem for obstruction if they eat a, a ton of it. So we don't really see, it says do not eat, but I mean, they probably could eat one and be fine. The toilet tank drop-ins, uh, so if you have these, they keep your your toilet bowl clean, but if you have an animal that drinks out of the toilet bowl, it will cause mild vomiting and nausea. Glow-in-the-dark products, they will drool or foam at the mouth. Batteries, um, we can, if they have an intact battery uh, that is not leaking acid, we can allow it to go through if we bulk the diet 
um, try to get it through pretty quick, quickly, or we can have them vomit it back up. If it's broken open, that means that acid is leaking out, or I'm sorry, the alkaline is leaking out. We we need to pull that out, out as quickly as possible. Maybe endoscopy, um, make them... Uh, Make, well, we don't want to make them vomit if it's uh, if it's uh, caustic, so we may have to do surgery. Ice, snow melts. Um, think about your dog uh, licking their paws after the, walking around on it, or they eat it because it's salty. So it causes oral and GI irritation. Um, and if they have um, skin t- contact with over a long period of time, it will cause dermal irritation as well. Here are some toxic plants: aloe vera, ivy. Jade, Diefenbachia, Philodendron, Devil's Ivy, Sago Palm, ZZ Plant, Elephant's Ear, Any Lily, Corn Plant, and Asparagus Fern. Anything in the rhododendron species, including azaleas and uh, rhododendrons, contain gray in toxins. Um, they lead to cardiovascular dysfunction. And there are a fair amount of, actual, uh, of cardiac glycoside plants that cause the heart to stop, basically. Um, and all parts of the plant are toxic, and you'll see signs develop within several hours of ingestion. So that includes oleander, foxglove, uh, the rubber vine, lily of the valley, uh, azaleas, periwinkles, um, sabi stars, star of Bethlehem, milkweed, bitterroot, and Christmas rose. So we do have to be very careful with how much we give uh, we, we, the animal eats. Castor beans that are sometimes used in jewel, uh, jewelry, uh, we have to give supportive care if they eat castor beans because that's toxic. Cycad palms or sago palms, um, most parts of the, uh, the plant are toxic, but especially the seeds. Um, and they, we have to be very careful uh, to prevent liver damage if they eat that. Lilies cause renal failure and death in cats, and so we want to decontaminate them very quickly and get them on IV fluid and try to protect the kidneys. These plants, the philodendron or Diefenbachia plants, um, have calcium oxalate crystals in the leaves. It's protective of for the plant. So when they eat the leaves, it actually these little crystals are expelled in the oral cavity, and it's very painful swelling. Um, so they won't do it very often, um, but if they do do it, it can be a problem. Ant and roach baits, usually it's not something that we have to worry about, unless there are some inert ingredients that are toxic. Um, the active ingredient actually isn't toxic, but this container, if they eat it, can act as a foreign body. Flea and tick products, well, any insecticide is going to have a potential for an adverse effect, but cats are really, really sensitive to concentrated permethrin, which is in most dog uh, products. So our first step when we're when we are treating symptomatic cats um, is that we need to control muscle muscle tremors with a muscle relaxant. We often have to put them on something to control seizures um, and decontaminate the cat. A lot of cats die from having the wrong flea uh, treatment put on them. Methomil is a carbamate insecticide found in fly baits, and this will cause um, them to drool. But basically, they get watery all over. They salivate, they lacrimate, they tear, they get urinary incontinence, diarrhea, dyspnea, and vomit. So um, um, they also coming in, getting into their lungs and vomiting out. So they just sort of explode everywhere. Um, metaldehyde is found in snail or slug bait. It's very, very toxic. They need a very small amount to kill them. Um, they, we usually see signs within 30 minutes to three hours of ingestion, um, and they go into this um, rigid paralysis. There are a number of different rodenticides. Um, there are anticoagulants that halt the recycling of vitamin K. Um, and this uh, includes warfarin. There's actually another called cholecalciferol, calci- um, which mobilizes uh, calcium um, and causes a death through hypocalcemia. There's bromethylene, which is the tomcat um, poison, uh, which causes uncoupling of oxidative for- phosphorylation in CNS. So it causes actually brain swelling um, and is extremely painful. Um, and they would you would need some aggressive decontamination. Uh, so very quickly. Oh, there's the cholecalciferol. Sorry. It increases intestinal absorption of calcium. So it causes um, 
bone resorption, kidney, kidney reabsorption um, of calcium, um, they tend to have, uh, they tend to lose uh, the, uh, basically they, they die of kidney failure. Um, and it can have a delayed onset, so they can eat it weeks ago and now we're, we're seeing them sick. Zinc phosphide is found in mole and gopher baits, and it's highly toxic, causing vomiting, dyspnea, and seizures. Um, we want to make them vomit outside or in another well-ventilated area. Ethylene glycol is the most dangerous type of antifreeze. There are a number of different types of antifreeze. Um, it is the one that was most commonly used. Um, it's an ethyl alcohol, uh, and so it is like a really overdosing on alcohol. Um, they're going to vomit in the first few hours, and then they're going to look like they're really, really drunk. Um, and by the by, 18 to 36 hours, they they're in acute renal failure. There are some antidotes for this. Um, the, actually, the most common antidote is um, ethanol. Um, ethanol, uh, not ethylene glycol, but ethanol. Ethanol uh, replaces um, the ethylene glycol in the receptors so that the ethylene glycol leaves the body and the ethanol stays in. The ethanol is a is like um, alcohol. Like actually, tip, typically, one of the things we'll do is go get 80 proof vodka from the liquor store and infuse that IV. Um, so uh, that's a, actually a fairly common way to, to treat ethylene glycol poisoning. Methanol is found in, uh, most commonly found in windshield washer fluid, and larger exposures can cause sedation and ataxia. Propylene glycol is th about three times less toxic in comparison with ethylene glycol. Propylene glycol is something we actually will give as a treatment for some things, um, but we do have to be very, very ca careful when we do because we can cause some CNS depression, weakness, ataxia, if they get large amounts too quickly. Some human medications that our animals can get into and have been for you know for a number of years, um, and what what do they cause? So acetaminophen is Tylenol. Tylenol causes um, some changes with the red blood cells, so we call that methemoglobinemia. It causes liver damage. Um, cats are very very sensitive to it. We will see depression, weakness, tachypnea, dyspnea. Uh, vomiting, hypothermia, facial and paw edema, hepatic necrosis, and death. So Tylenol is very dangerous, especially to cats. Um, we can give small doses of acetaminophen to dogs, but because people don't know the difference really between acetaminophen, which is Tylenol, and ibuprofen, which is Advil, um, we don't often recommend it. Aspirin or ibuprofen are non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Aspirin can be given in certain doses to dogs and cats, but you have to be very careful when you give it. Ibuprofen cannot be given to dogs and cats. If they eat too much of it, and, and if you think about it, those little tablets of ibuprofen are sugar-coated, so the animals will eat them and think they're M&Ms. Um, so we have to be really careful about it. Um, they will get depressed, see vomiting, stomach ulcers, anorexia, hyperthermia, acidosis, and then eventually it will kill their liver. And again, cats are very, very susceptible to it. Dogs, not as much, but they, are, they will also uh, die of ibuprofen toxicity. Sudafed or amphetamines are used um, for ADD treatment. So Ritalin is, is an amphetamine, and they can cause increased, increased blood pressure, tachycardia, ataxia, midriasis, which is the, when the pupils get really large, um, hyperactivity, tremors, and seizures. Um, people being treated for tuberculosis with isoniazid, um, we can see life-threatening signs of seizures, acidosis, and coma. Um, calcipotriene, which is a topical treatment for psoriasis, and we see a lot of psoriasis, um, at least according to the, the commercials, I see a lot of psoriasis. Um, but it's a, because it's a topical treatment, people don't often think of it as a as a medication. And the same thing with 5-fluorouracil, uh, which is a topical anti-cancer treatment. The problem is that animals will come up and sit next to them and get it on them and maybe groom themselves, or they'll lick their owner. And calcipotriene can result in kidney failure, cardiac failure, and death. Um, and 5-fluorouracil will result in grand mal seizures, tremors, vomiting, and ataxia, and death within 6 to 16 hours. Some drugs of abuse. Um, the problem with this is people won't often 
admit that their animal has um, gotten into these drugs. And so sometimes it's difficult for us to determine what's causing um, causing the animal to act in the way that they do. So, or they'll say that they're, they think their neighbor poisoned them or something like that. So marijuana um, is becoming increasingly a problem. Um, talking with the um, emergency room uh, vets, uh, they're saying they see, see it every day. Um, and uh, it's, it really increases, the toxicity increases when the pet plant is damaged by heating, drying, smoking, or aging, which is the way that people typically consume it. The onset of clinical signs in dogs occurs about 30 to 90 minutes after ingestion. It's just what you think it would be. Um, they're going to act kind of dopey. Um, they'll, they'll be out of it. Um, we can decontaminate by making them vomited, vomit, but if it's been a while, they may have to undergo some further treatment. Um, often it's just keeping supporting them with fluids, uh, making sure that, that uh, they're getting um, nutrition um, while they're out of it uh, until, we, until they come back around. Cocaine is a potential CNS stimulant. Um, dogs can show signs of serotonin syndrome, uh, which actually can lead to death. Um, we can see lethargy to CNS excitement to hyperactivity, hyperthermia to kipnia, erratic behavior and seizures. Ethanol or alcohol, um, we'll see vomiting, ataxia, CNS depression, hypotension, hypothermia, arrhythmias, respiratory depression, and coma. Um, much worse uh, if it is that concentrated hops that's left over from beer brewing. Methamphetamine is a stimulant, and so we'll see immediate symptoms, uh, very much like the amphetamines that we'll see uh, as treatment for ADD. If you have any questions, bring them to class. Um, there's a lot of material. Make sure you can categorize and kind of understand where the, what the toxins are affecting. So you can write down liver and then just go through and see which toxins affect the liver. You can say uh, kidney, which affect the kidney, which affect the red blood cells. That's just one way to categorize some of the toxins and get to know them a little bit better. Oh. Um. 